up? Welcome. I believe it's after midnight. I've been working. Actually, this has been a really long day. I'm really tired. I got up, well, last night we worked late. And then this morning, I got up earlier than I probably should have, but I couldn't go back to sleep. And then my sister and her wife texted me and they were like, hey, we're going to go run some errands and then we're going to go head down to the tomato festival. And tomato festival is something that happens here in East Nashville every summer in August. And it's during the culmination of like tomato season. And it's just like a big arts and crafts fe festival. There's like tons of food trucks and this year there was like sev like multiple stages with like live music playing. Um, and it's Nashville and there's a lot of indie bands and stuff here. So there's always good music and yeah, it was just really fun. I had to go really fast because I had to work this afternoon and we were going in a little earlier than usual. And so I just kind of squeezed it in. I just made it happen and I'm glad I pulled it off because I ended up getting like this cute t-shirt with this like graphic, this like, um, what evil can evil with like the, uh, tiger or whatever. <clears throat> I liked that. And I got a really awesome necklace made out of um, African sea glass beads that was like really, really awesome. And yeah, so, and then I had um, a really good crab cake and Greek salad because the paella wasn't ready yet. Because when is the paella ever ready yet? I was like, this is like wine country. So I had just enough time to get down there for about an hour or so and see, you know, some close friends and not drink or anything, just eat and then rush over to work. And it was a good night. And I am now feeling positively exhausted from a job well done. <laughs> and I'm patting myself on the back. And we are here for Secret Teachings of Jesus. This is our secret sermon that we do on Saturday night. And we basically are here doing this segment because I was really curious in my own life about reading the Navajo Body scriptures and the Dead Sea Scrolls and just, you know, the Gnostic Gospels in general. I was really curious about it and I was just really interested and I didn't know when I'd have time to sneak it in. And so I thought we could all do this together just for fun um, in the video uh, or through internet world because <laughs> I'm really here and you're really there. And we're onto the same moon. Um, yeah, so I basically will read the portion to you guys and probably read it poorly. And then I will go back and read it again because there's probably going to be footnotes and stuff that we are going to gonna go give little caveats to. And then we will unpack this um, line for line. All right. Um, oh, I meant to grab, you know what, I'm going to run and do this really fast because I wanted to grab our little chart, little map of reality. I'm wearing like the ugliest sweatpants in the world right now, but they're really cozy. I got them for free from a show I worked on. <laughs> it's like a set gift. Oh, okay, cool. I have our map and um, yeah, a couple of notes about um, another reason why we do this on um, late night. Uh, I'm at work on Saturday nights usually anyway, but it's also beneficial. The um, Kabbalist sages of old for, you know, since the beginning of time have been studying late at night around midnight and between the midnight hours and dawn because those are very powerful times of day. When you look at this map, you have here is the right column, which is masculine energy, the left-hand column, which is feminine energy, and the central column here. This may be, like when I say right and left, it may look weird to you because of the camera, but I'm double checking because sometimes I get flipped too because of the camera. Um, central column energy is when everything is grounded and balanced, right? These are kind of like the governing forces of the universe and they're, they're these virtues, right? That we need to bring into balance inside of us. But if they go out of balance, they become like vices. So everything in the universe is this layered representation of this glyph. And this glyph has all kinds of information and associated things with it. Um, and, it, and it's just this like, almost like this mental yoga when you start taking in all of the associations with each of these organized categories. 
So when we talk about times of day, um, days of the week, there are like, um, you know, weeks of the year, seasons, all kinds of things are associated with right column and left column energy and central column energy. And so right column energy is the energy of mercy. And so that's good. That's positive. And we like that. And then central column energy is neutral to good. And then left column energy is judgment. And this is when we either have to show um, proactive self-discipline in order to avoid judgment, or we are disciplined by um, being out of balance and having that backlash come back and, and uh, bite us in the butt. Okay, so the sages would study during this time of night because these hours are associated with the central column energy. And the other most positive hours of the day are the beginning hours because they're the new and the beginning. So that would be like sunrise to noon. Um, that is the most positive being at sunrise because it's the full amount of sun. And then the positivity sort of tapers off and the hours get more negative towards midnight and then midnight it sort of goes neutral again that's a lot of information to sink in but kabbalah is interesting it's like you get little snippets here and there and everything sounds like it doesn't make any sense until one day it does and you're like oh it's all connected i get it now um <clears throat> Another reason this is a good powerful time to study and absorb more light than we would in a normal um, uh, time is that, that there are these windows of time are open and they're like portals of energy, right? And so um, we're up right now and we are in this liminal space between the end of yesterday and the beginning of another day. And so in many magical and spiritual traditions, um, midnight is a powerful time to um, connect and it's a it's the veil is thin then because of that being in that liminal space and then finally we are exhausted and we are pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zone and so we are sacrificing the flesh and the spirit of Eucharist um, you know laying our flesh down and delaying instant gratification for the sake of um, evolu uh, uh, elevation and expansion of consciousness and receiving the light for the sake of sharing with others, right? So we're here, we're doing our best. It's after midnight and we're so tired. And whenever I start these videos this late, I can feel like my eyes just wanting to close. So forgive me if while I'm channeling, I sometimes I feel insane or like I'm sounding insane, but then I go back and watch later and it's all making sense. So I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully it's all making gonna make sense, but if it doesn't, your soul will understand. Okay, so our portion today, we've been in the Gospel of Philip for the past few weeks. We had been working on a portion called the Inner and the Outer, and it's so funny because when I first read that, that it was basically just like one small paragraph almost, I was like, I don't know what we're gonna even talk about with this, and then it ended up being five episodes for five weeks. So. Tonight, we are moving on to a portion called Wisdom and Mary of Magdala. Okay, let us begin. Wisdom, who is called Baron, is the mother of angels. The companion of the Savior is Mary of Magdala. The Savior loved her more than all the disciples, and he kissed her often on the mouth. The other disciples said to him, Why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, Why don't I love you like her? If a blind person and one who can see are both in darkness, they are the same. When the light comes on, one who can see will see the light, and the blind person will stay in darkness. Sick burn, Jesus! Every time I love I love Jesus so much because every time his disciples like in all of these gospels are like why do you love Mary Magdalene more Jesus and he's like maybe it's because you don't get it <laughs> they're like why Jesus we're not doing it you said that we need to do this and we try and we are but you keep saying that we're not and we are and he's like no you just don't you just don't get it so Jesus is always like no matter what the disciples are complaining because they're like you're just we can never do anything right Jesus. <laughs> 
And then they're like, what do you, what do you want to say about that? And he's like, you just don't get it. <laughs> they're like, ah! <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read this again, but this time I'm going to include the footnote. So wisdom, uh, the word wisdom or the name wisdom so when they're saying wisdom here, who is called barren, wisdom is like personified. Well, in the Hebrew tradition, wisdom is seen as uh, a divine feminine goddess named Sophia. Not like a notification. Okay, so this could be read as wisdom or Sophia. So we'll, we'll try it this way. Sophia, or wisdom, who is called barren is the mother of angels. And then it notes that you could divide this sentence differently. Instead of saying um, the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdala, you could read it this way. Um, Wisdom, who is called barren, is the mother of the angels and the companion of the Savior. So wisdom, who is called barren, is the mother of the angels and the companion of the Savior. The Savior loved Mary of Magdala. Okay, so wisdom or Sophia, who is called barren, is the mother of all, of the angels. The companion of the Savior is Mary Magdala. The Savior loved her more than all the disciples, and he kissed her often on the mouth. The other disciples said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, why don't I love you like her? If a blind person and one who can see are both in darkness, they are the same. When the light comes, or when the light comes, one who can see will see the light, and the blind person will stay in darkness. Okay, so one thing I would like to note is that wisdom um, personified as Sophia, there's a whole um, book in the Gnostic Gospels, I think it's with the Nag Hammadi collection, called the Pistis Sophia. And it's a really, really, like, far out cosmic adventure, almost like this sci-fi meta thriller about this, the suffering of Sophia, because Sophia, um, it's a, it's a very long story, we won't get into it, but wisdom is Sophia. And so in that story about Sophia, Sophia kind of was like looking outside of her role um, and like wanting to reach higher and wanting to be um, a bigger vessel than she was or, or fulfill a purpose that wasn't really meant for her. And so it caused her to fall and she got trapped in hell. And so um, Jesus had to like go to these different dimensions and try to save Sophia. So it's interesting how um, when we get our sights focused on the wrong thing, our wisdom falls, falls prey, right? I just thought that was interesting. Also on this diagram, the supernal mother, Bina, this is the divine feminine supernal energy, like the very most primal root of all feminine energy. Um, it is the very first vessel. It is the space that holds our reality, right? But it, the word that is associated with, with this uh, sifra, uh, sfirat is understanding. She... Uh, It's like there's some different level about, it's like the divine masculine is truth, like the truth of the light, but divine feminine is like the integrated wisdom, the heart of it is what it almost seems like to me. It's like the masculine is the truth the logic, the reason, the way that they put it into action. But the divine feminine takes all that same information, that same experience or whatever, and understands it from an internal place. Wisdom who is called barren is the mother of angels. 
And so when you get up into this, like higher up on the tree, the light, the pure light comes in here. And so everything is contained in it. It's completely unified and it's completely whole. And so as it goes through these different stations, it's basically like these are sort of like filtration systems or um, alternators that condition the energy and break it down so that we can process it so that it's not overwhelming to us. So, so everything is contained in the thing above it, right? And so when the light came in here first, it was completely abstract. And then as it shifted over into the next dimension or phase or level of becoming, it became this raw, unadulterated, pure dynamism force of masculine energy. And it was still pretty abstract, but it was, it was, um, it was just raw power at that point. It hadn't been formed or shaped. And so once we get to the divine feminine, this is where the first re active restriction happens where there is boundary given. It's the vessel that holds all of this power and this like wild force that's out of control. It has no shape, it has no structure, it has no framework or focus. So that goes into this dimension where it is then contained. Like, see this box lid? This is that. It gives frame, it gives, it's a container. It gives something to hold the space within, right? So that is what is meant by um, wisdom is the mother of angels. It comes from that place. I think that in the Hebrew translation of Genesis, I believe that it literally reads like in the beginning there was wisdom in Bereshit. I don't quote me on that, but I think I remember remembering that one time and noticing it and being like, oh, that's interesting. So at the core of it all, and like King Solomon valued wisdom above anything else, right? They say if you, um, if you chase wisdom, then abundance and prosperity will chase you. So that's that divine feminine, that the goddess of wisdom there. And okay, so the companion, and I think that because they, they immediately shift talking about Mary Magdalene, I believe that like Jesus and Mary Magdalene were equals and divine counterparts. I mean, she wasn't divine like Jesus was, but the closest thing to becoming Christ-like, to ascending, to um, going through the steps of the ascension of the soul alongside the Christ, like she was his feminine counterpart. She was his equal in this life as like a companion to go through this life with. Um, so I think that he was able to communicate his truth out into the world but Mary was the only vessel that could really receive it and understand it. He tried to pass his truth to the disciples, but it didn't live in their heart the way that Mary, it did for Mary. The seed of truth was planted in the other disciples and they missed a lot of the depth. They kept getting all caught up in the outer, right? When we were talking about the outer and the inner. They kept thinking like, hey, when, Jesus, when are we gonna take over the government? Like, are you, am I gonna be in your cabinet? Like, they kept taking everything very literally and they kept thinking that they were gonna, you know, have this big takeover of power. And what Mary understood is what they were doing was they were taking power over themselves. They were learning to be empowered by self-mastery and the fruit of the spirit self-control, which helps you can't really embody any of the other fruits of the spirit without self-control. You may have moments with them, but you can't really be eternal like the creator unchanging the cause 
of those fruits without self-control. The self-control helps you be the cause and not the effect, right? So Mary was a vessel that could contain the light and actually put it, like bring life to it. It was a living word when it hit Mary. It didn't end there. She was able to comprehend it in such a way where the wisdom started taking root and it started growing, right? It wasn't just a tree branch that fell off of the, of the trunk. She was able to grow with it and keep planting more trees and make it into a forest. Jesus was getting, um, frustrated at times when he would talk to his disciples because he didn't want them to just end with what he said. He wanted them to take on the ideas and bring them to life and let it keep growing and keep developing and keep keep expanding, right? And so Mary was able to do that for him. And without her as the vessel, his light just would, you know, it would it, it only got so far, right? So she was able to carry that wisdom in her heart and comprehend it through, um, through a deeper level of understanding. Um, the Savior loved her more than all the disciples, and he kissed her often on the mouth. And I think that this is also representative, not only did they literally you know, exchange kisses and affection, but I think it, it's, it's talking about their discourse that they could exchange equal conversation um, and it was a point of intimacy between them. Uh, the other disciples said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? Oh, I also wanted to point out that like the divine union is happening here between like the, the divine masculine of Jesus and the divine feminine of Mary. Like it's, I have this actually, um, this is a Merkaba, but you'll see that like the six point star is an up, upward triangle, which is the masculine married equally with the feminine, the um, inverse triangle, and they're brought together as one. So, you know, and when we represent that at the human level, it's like when two people join as one. And like, as far as like electricity goes, whether gen gender isn't really a factor, it's like there's always like a more um, masculine, energy in a relationship and a more feminine energy, a more active, um, leader energy and a more like a, like a, a follower or a, um, not, uh, like a submiss, not a sub it's like a sub, but like, you know, like the, the person who will let the other one lead, you know, like, so, um, that there's like this divine balance happening there where, the whole of the two united become stronger than than one alone, right? Also with us, with the with the creator, we are the the feminine vessel here as the human being, and the light is always the masculine sharing and giving to us. And so we want to like unite, right, in that in that marriage of the divine and the and the human and when we do that there's this realization inside of us that we've always been whole and complete and we are actually made from and of love and we have no limitations because we are one with the almighty and the almighty is experiencing this physical realm through us. And just like, you know, masculine and feminine there, divine gets to experience this realm through our physical manifestation, right? So there's a privilege and an honor of being human. We're the ones that get to come here into this like incarnation and live out in this physical realm and have the privilege of 
sharing a hug, going on a walk, eating food. Can you imagine not having a body and it all just being thought, you know, and not being able to take part in this physical world? So there's this divinity that we have inherent within us as human beings. But we're going through this life always like under the assumption that our humanness is our the faulty part of us, that it's the problem, that it's the broken part. But it isn't, it's just the difficult part. <laughs> it's the part that's like the gauntlet that we have to overcome. But it's about shedding the layers that cause us to forget who we really are. And then being reconnected again with the memory of the fullness of who we really are. And we are divine and we are human and all of our faults and weaknesses are perfectly okay. And we're perfect just the way we are. And yet, to be fully fulfilled, we want to stretch and we want to become more because you know what we want to have affinity with the light we want to be like god because at the very core of our being god is us we are pieces of god expressing out into this world so it would only make sense that we would want like on a deep level even if it's not even consciousness that we would always want to be expanding and not necessarily we don't have to label it self-improvement or healing or fixing anything but we're always pushing against our growth edge right um in some translations of the bible when um it talks about god saying um, i am that i am some translations say i am that which i am becoming and I think that that's a great way to think of it and to look at it and, and to translate that because it's like that's that's the most like God you can be. Even God is in a state of becoming. It's not like a finite ended thing. It always is becoming. It's that thousand petaled lotus, right? That's always like in perpetual blooming, like layer after layer after layer after layer after layer. We are always blooming. We are always in a state of becoming. So I am that which I am becoming. We are never, you know, limited, right? We are, well, we are limited in that way, but in our divinity, it, there's a certain part of us that is never limited. Um, we're always connected with the absolute. It's pretty wild. Um, so let's see, we're talking about divine marriage of the divine masculine and feminine. We're talking about the divinity and the humanity being equally valuable um, and being able to fully appreciate both at once. The other disciples said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? It's like, well, because she kisses me on the mouth often and I do not want to be kissing you guys on the mouth often. No kidding. Um, why do you love her more than us? And the Savior answered and said to them, why don't I love you like her? If a blind person and one who can see are both in darkness, they are the same. When the light comes, one who can see will see the light and the blind person will stay in darkness. And yes, I think this is, you know, once again, Jesus is warning the disciples or trying to gently like let them know like you're you're not really seeing all the things that I'm trying to share with you. You're not getting the deepest levels of it, right? Because in the Bible, everything has like four layers of meaning and it starts at the most surface and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And I believe it's like the physical realm, like the like the obvious mundane, you know, right and wrong kind of things in the in the 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 most obvious part of the story and the surface part of the story. And then there's usually like a symbolic level of the story that's talking about, you know, that's speaking in parable and it's speaking about um our the way we emotionally relate to people in life, like on a on a, on a heart level. And then it goes down to like the soul level. Um, and it kind of goes into a deeper lesson in meaning of um, what's behind, you know, the 
the meaning of each story and parable and, and lesson and verse and whatnot. But then there's a, a mystical level and that's the deepest level. And that is like the spiritual truth that there's like this technology happening underneath and there's like this crazy like metaphysical happening going on. All of this is going on behind the scenes. And so each everything that you read in the Bible is not just talking about the surface level stuff. It's like, there's like four things going on at the same time at any given time. And so basically Jesus is like, look, you guys understand the very surface level and you're kind of getting like into like, you know, the next layer in, but like Mary Magdalene, like she gets it like all the way through. And like, not only does she like get it when I, when I'm saying to her, but she's got her own revelation about it that she's bringing to the picture. She was able to successfully go through the discipline of transcending the soul and the path of ascension, you know, with Jesus side by side with him. And I don't think that the other disciples had successfully completed that. <laughs> they weren't even quite understanding what was fully going on. So, yeah, I think that Jesus was just like, look, I connect with Mary. I mean, she is like the counterpart of my truth. Like, she is the wisdom. She's got the revelation. It's like the seed has taken root inside of her and it's alive. And y'all are just <laughs> here ignorant. You don't get it. <laughs> Bunch of men. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yes. So very interesting. It's interesting too how Mary on a surface level, like they were literally close and maybe even more than friends and companions. Uh, but on a deeper level, edgy ear. Um, I think Mary, Mary Magdalene, I, I believe that Mary Magdalene was like Jesus's soulmate and like twin flame, if you, um, believe and know what twin flame is. And, um, they had this mission <laughs> that was bigger than them. Um, and yeah, I think, and it just goes into, but there's also like Mary also represents like Sophia, like the wisdom goddess. And so this like, even it just as Mary Magdalene and Jesus, there's so many layers there. It's so interesting. But you guys, I think that we are finished up for tonight. I think that we have covered it. I think that we have understood here that Mary is the embodied wisdom of the truth of Christ. Uh, she represents the vessel of us receiving the light of divine um, we talked about the holy union of human and divine and the union of the masculine and the feminine, which when that, when we can balance the masculine and the feminine with, with, within us and like those are united within us, that is like the divine marriage of the, like if we become whole and like united with our full like divine force and, and united with our higher self at that point, which is always connected like straight to spirit, straight to God. Direct connection. All right, y'all. I am sleepy. I'm tired. I am hungry. So I am going to wind down. I hope that you guys have a good rest of the weekend. I will see you again tomorrow for our weekly um, Oracle forecast for the week coming up. All right, y'all. Good night. Ciao.